tanse Daryl is here, Gaso. Why are you in here? I miss what she was going to see me. Doris Bertha Negawi, Sonny Clifford Notawi. So I just introduced myself in Cree, saying where I'm from, northern Alberta, near Edmonton, and that my mother is Bertha Dora and my father is Clifford James. And we do that um, when we're meeting new people and uh, introducing ourselves and our culture. So I'm Daryl McLeod. I'm Cree or Nehiao from Northern Alberta, from the Lesser Slave Lake area, just north of Edmonton. But I've been living, working, writing, and uh, making music here on the west coast of Vancouver Island in the territory, the unceded traditional territory of the Silk First Nation and the Silk people. What was my favorite book as a child? I think it had to be The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. So I, I just loved um, the mystery and adventure of it, and the characters were so alive. And um, it portrayed the freedom and uh, craziness of childhood. And I think it also portrayed it, well, uh, it also portrayed a different cultural perspective than I was used to around me growing up in a small town of northern Alberta. And so I was intrigued by that. And um, I really liked um, seeing a different culture like that. I just loved it. And I have to say, when I was a kid, I'm dating myself a little bit, but <laughs> when I was going to uh, elementary school in northern Alberta, there were very limited choices. Um, I think I would still have loved, I know I would have still loved that book. But, uh, you know, we were reading readers like uh, about Dick Spot and Jane, and I think in grades one, two, and three, and um, just there was very limited or no Indigenous cultural perspective or worldview in any of the books that we read. And uh, interestingly, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is the the book that came closest to my reality, I guess, and uh, I, I was quite intrigued by it and loved it. What is a recent book I've read? Well, I'm reading a book called Petra right now by my mentor, uh, Shana Lambert. And it's about the woman who was a feminist and environmental activist uh, in Germany who started the Green Party in Germany and worldwide and was actually successful in convincing uh, the powers that be um, Germany and the uh, uh, other countries they are aligned with to remove um, the nuclear missiles that they were uh, had either installed or were about to install. This was in the 80s. And so Petra, the, what I love about the book, the story, I have to be honest, when, when I read the plot line, you know, it was sounded intriguing, but it didn't grab me from my personal perspective as a, a topic, a subject matter that would really interest me. But um, Shana Lambert's writing style is just phenomenal. Um, you know, in fact, I was going to send her a message and uh, say that, you know, she should take the Vancouver telephone book and rewrite it and uh, it would probably become a bestseller. Uh, just her, her style is so phenomenal. Her, um, her sentence structure, the structure of the whole novel, um, her characters have just come to life. Uh, I read her book every morning uh, af with coffee and uh, after breakfast. And um, yeah, I feel like I'm having coffee with the, the circle of uh, characters that she's created in this book and, and truly brought to life. And one of the things I love about her characters is they're every one of them, I, I think there are four or five main characters but they're all com complex characters they're you can't say you know that Emil is a good guy or a bad guy he's got good elements and bad elements but interestingly even the characters that you don't want to like this this fellow Emil I'm mentioning is a, a retired military general um, from the German army and you don't and, and you know during the Nazi era and so you, you, of course you don't want to like him <laughs> but you end up liking him, even though at the same time you want to despise him and what he's done and what he represents. Uh, but Shana has worked this, this tremendous magic in Petra. And um, I've always, I've admired Shana's work for a long time. As I said, she was my mentor. 
uh, as I wrote uh, Mama Scotch and uh, worked, helped me work through um, the editing of the first version of the manuscript of Mama Scotch. And we worked together for about a year and a half on that. And uh, I admire her so much. And I've been wait she's been working on Petra for a number of years. And I've been waiting with bated breath to get my hands on it. And uh, it's out now. So I'm just thrilled about it. I, I love I love that book. What other resources do I use from the library? To answer this question, I'm going to share a, a little anecdote that's that's I find quite amusing, and I think you will too. Um, I was such a nerd in in junior high school, and I had a few nerdy friends. We belonged to the debating club, and um, we always needed to do a lot of research for our debates. And um, so we would spend hours in the library every morning. We'd get to school early, and then at lunchtime we'd be in the library. And we would hide. We had an, an this is really mean in a way. We had an aging librarian, Mrs. Miss Rawlings, who she you know she's probably retirement age or past retirement age. And we used to hide in the library and wait for her to leave and lock up so we could, we could keep doing our research. <laughs> and we would literally skip skip dinner and stay like until eight or nine o'clock at night in the library um, doing our work and doing our research for our debating club and for some projects we were working on. It's quite funny. And so libraries have always been quite a refuge for me. And um, when I was at university, um, I went to the University of British Columbia. I remember walking out of the library with literally like 20 books each time I took books out. And so at that time, a lot of them were, um, were reference books, so, you know, nonfiction. Um, but there was always a handful of fiction, too. And um, I just love the rich resources of the uh, university library, especially like UBC, where the, university, the library is so huge and has so many facets to it. So in addition to the printed material, I used to always also go to the, uh, there's a library there called the Wilson Recording Library. And they had... Um, well, you know, it, it's an audio, vis audio uh, library. And at the time they had mainly records, but I think they were just moving, really dating myself. So they had mainly LPs, vinyl, but they also had some cassette recordings and some reel-to-reel, -reel, things like that. And um, they had historic um, documentation of, um, of First Nations culture in terms of... Uh, chants and historic songs and sacred songs and music that would nowadays be considered sacred to First Nations. And uh, so I used to take those records out and listen to them. And But it was there was this whole panoply. So on the one hand, one trip to the Wilson Recording Library, I might be taking out, you know, these uh, recordings of historic songs of the West Coast uh, tribes or of the tribes of the interior. And in an Another vinyl would be Elizabeth, Elizabeth Schwarzkopf singing Schubert music uh, because I was intrigued by um, the music of Schubert. And um, one poem in particular that I write about in my second book, uh, er, um, Erkenig, Der Erkenig, The Earl King, uh, just grabbed me. And Elizabeth Schwarzkopf's version of it is just mind boggling. So that would, I would spend so much time in addition to the printed books in the, of the library, the Wilson Recording Library. And now, you know, that the media of libraries has shifted yet again with technology, the advances in technology, I, I can't imagine um, what must be available in, in libraries for people to use. Um, I did a, a reading at a library on the east side of Vancouver um, and, uh, you know, a, a poor neighborhood in, uh, in Vancouver, and uh, I was so pleased to see that a lot of the, the poor people from the downtown east side were in the library. The, the place was full, you know, and um, all of the, the booths where people could use computers uh, were full. And um, it, it was a place of refuge and a place that opened the horizons of these poor people. And I guess that's where I'm going with this. That that's what it did for me back uh, in, in northern Alberta and Athabasca, that um, high school library just opened the universe for me uh, with, in that, those days, printed material. And then later, the UBC library um, opened up a whole new world to me. 
And uh, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in libraries and um, I hope that uh, more uh, First Nations kids in rural areas and, um, and urban areas come to know libraries as places of rich resources where they're welcome and where they feel at home and where they feel safe. And I have to say that's one of the biggest things for libraries for me um, in school and uh, public libraries, but also at university, I always felt safe. And I would go to study in the library at UBC. UBC for me was this big daunting institution and I was this kid from a small village, an indigenous kid, a Creek kid from Northern Alberta. And university was often quite um, overwhelming, the experience, but the library was always a safe place for me. And don't let me get started on librarians and how helpful and wonderful they can be. But, um, you know, um, I don't know if you're, you've heard of the book um, Out of the Ashes by Jesse Thistle. Um, it's about a, a homeless man's, um, obviously out of the ashes, survival and uh, recovery from being a street person. And he um, thanks and acknowledges a librarian, and I think it was in downtown Winnipeg, or it might have been Regina, um, for helping bring him off of the street because she used to help him when he'd go into the library to just use the library as this poor lost street person who was struggling with addictions. And, you know, eventually uh, her kindness got through to him and got him reading material that really helped him. And I think it, her, obviously her kindness also really helped him. So that's been my experience as well, both personally and professionally. Um, so I could go on forever about libraries and the beauty of libraries and, and librarians. How does my life story affect my relationship with the, the types of books I'm drawn to? Well, now as an author and a writer, um, I choose my, my reading material quite deliberately. And um, if I could take you on a little tour around my house, you'd see stacks of books in every room. and. Um, I'm not bragging about that. I'm actually embarrassed about that because uh, I need to find a better system of organizing and storing my, my books. But um, I choose um, authors who inspire me. Um, for example, I have a lot of Alice Munro books, a lot of Alice Munro books, and I've read maybe two thirds of them and I have a stack of stack more waiting. She was very prolific as you know. And as everyone knows, um, she's the Canada's Nobel, Nobel Prize winner for literature. Um, anyway, the reason I have Alice Munro books on mass like that is uh, she's a, an author um, I admire tremendously. Uh, there's an expert on writing who I've become friends with. His name is Douglas Glover, and he actually gave me my first break in the publishing world by publishing one of my short stories in his literary magazine. In any case, Douglas Glover has written two books on writing, maybe more, but two that I've read and that I have. And the first is called The Curse of the Copula Spider. And uh, it's about editing. And um, the copula spider is the circles and the connecting lines that an editor can draw when they're in their uh, the, the throes of editing somebody's work enthusiastically. Um, but in that book, there's one chapter that's entitled The, the Mind of Alice Munro. And, you know, when I was writing Mama Scotch, I read and reread that chapter so many times. Um, just, I learned so much about writing from, from that chapter on the mind of Alice Munro and how she thinks and the magic of her work. Uh, Douglas Glover is very good at kind of deconstructing uh, people's techniques and methodology, and um, he did an excellent job of uh, of deconstructing and analyzing Alice Munro's work and helping others to learn from it. And um, I, any other authors who grab my attention? But for example, I just talked to you about Petra. Um, there's another book that's current right now that I think is going to do very well also, and it's um, called A Russian Sister by Caroline Adderson. And uh, I just got it the other day um, because Caroline was another writing mentor. She was my mentor at the BAP Center for the Arts a couple of years ago. And I think she's an absolute brilliant writer. 
and um, I'm anxious to to get that book opened and uh, read her. But there was another author um, I read about, Anna Marie MacDonald, and her book, Fall on Your Knees. And I just read one review, and I thought, I have to get that book. And, you know, I became obsessed with finding it. And when I find it, found it, you know, I sat down and read it. I mean, I didn't do it all in one sitting because it's a huge book, but um, I didn't read anything else for about a month, the month that I was studying. And I, I did, I said, I was going to say studying that book. And that's truly what I did. I studied it uh, because she was so incredibly brilliant in, in her writing and her uh, plot, the construction of her plot. She, I don't mean to give a spoiler here, but she kills her protagonist about halfway through the book. And it's somebody that you've come to care about tremendously. And you think, well, where can the book go now that she's killed the main character? But you know, she very quickly, you know, replaces that main character with another fascinating uh, main character. And uh, on and on, I, I just love that book, Fall on Your Knees by Anna Marie MacDonald. And another book I was reading, um, The Polished Toe by Austin Clark. Um, it just, somebody gave it to me as a gift and uh, just kind of out of the blue. And I'd read good things about it. But I became intrigued from the beginning of the book because one of the things I was learning in my writing was how to write dialogue. And that whole book is a discussion between a chief of police and a friend of his, a, a woman who's accused of murder. And the entire book, and it's probably about you know 450 pages, is the, the conversation between these two characters. And I learned so much about doing dialogue. And you know, that's a work of genius if you can carry a plot and carry an the plot of an entire book uh, simply through dialogue. It was, it's just amazing. Now, there's a, there's so many books that I find deliberately or that I seek out by authors that I admire. And um, like I say, if, <laughs> if we have time to ever do a little tour, you know, of my, my home or not, I'm not a tour of my home, but of my reading material, you know, I'll, set up the stack of books and uh, show you the the authors I've recently read and the authors that I hope to read within the next year. What does the library mean to me? Um, well, because of my background, one important thing of what my background of being an Indigenous kid uh, who went through a lot of abuse and instability in my personal life, in my home as a child. Um, um, a library, I guess above all, means safety and security. That's what it meant to me growing up and it still does. And, um, and it also means um, a journey that whenever I go into a library, it's going to broaden my horizons. I'm going to learn something and um, it's, it's going to be a fascinating experience. Although I have to say that a library is one of those types of places and an experience that um, where you get out of it what you put into it. So I think it's really important uh, to understand the richness that a library can offer. And these days, as I was saying, uh, I think that richness must just be off the charts with all the technology. Um, that's available. For example, in, in my last um, book, my second book, Pia Ga, which is uh, going to be out in March, it's the sequel to Mama Scotch, uh, my first memoir. I needed to re I wanted to write one chapter of historical fiction um, about the negotiation of Treaty 8, which is the treaty that, that's in place in the territory where I come from. And um, so I went to uh, the library had a speaking engagement at the University of Alberta. And so I booked a day just to spend in their library because they have a lot of uh, rich resources. And, you know, it's phenomenal. I, I did some of the research there, but um, one of the librarian I needed to talk to was away, but I arranged to be in touch with, with that person once I got back home here to, to Souk in BC. And the richness I was able to get online by accessing a library online and tapping into the resources online just blew my mind. I was able to open, open and read and um, 
actually in some cases copy and paste from historical documents. Uh, it's, uh, I, I just can't believe the linkages now between uh, un university libraries, public libraries um, in Canada, the United States and all over the world. And, um, and just one other little side note about libraries. When I did a tour of the United States last summer and fall, um, the, my, the U.S. publisher of Mama Scotch arranged for me to do all these speaking engagements in a lot of the larger cities in the U.S. And in every city, I went into the public library. Um, I just wanted to check out the space and see what it was like and see what kind of priority those cities had placed on their library as an institution, um, a public institution, a public library. And in every case, I was just thrilled with um, the investment the communities have made in the library. Great facilities, physical facilities, rich with resources. Um, some libraries had incorporated um, the arts in such an amazing way. Um, like the public library in Madison, Wisconsin uh, was brand new and they built it adjoining to their um, uh, center for the arts, to a center for the arts. And, you know, they had incorporated a painting studio. They had incorporated an experiential reading room for toddlers and uh, children. Uh, amazing audiovisual resources, almost I would say experiential audiovisual resources. And um, I, I was just um, blown away by the, the richness of the libraries that I saw in different parts of the United States. And in every library I made a point in the US, I made a, a point of checking to see if they had my book, um, Mama Scotch, and they did, every one of them. Uh, I was just thrilled, that was, that was nice. So there's libraries on the other end of the spectrum. For me as an author, a library is an amazing uh, way of getting, getting my story and my material out there. And so that applies to all authors, I guess, that uh, a library is an amazing way of sharing our work and our art with the world. What does it mean to me to see my work in a library's collection? And what does my work being in libraries mean to the queer Indigenous community? It's incredibly validating to go into a library in a city like Chicago, which I did, and search, you know, go to their computer and do a search for your book and to see it come up, see that they have four copies and that there's their holds, uh, people waiting to get your book. Uh, that's just such an incredible validation. And um, so there was that spectrum of validation, but earlier on and before my book um, was nominated for the Governor General's Award or shortlisted or before it won it, um, my publicist and I would just occasionally, maybe once a week, do a Google search to see where things were at in terms of the circulation and um, distribution of, of Mama Scotch. And um, one of my earliest pleasant surprises was to see that uh, dozens of rural libraries in Alberta, if not all of them, they may, uh, they may do their acquisitions together, I'm not sure, but uh, had my book and had the, my book referenced and mentioned in their card catalog and um, people could put holds on it and online and stuff like that. So for my book to be out in rural Alberta, that's where I'm from and that's where part of the book it takes place. And um, that was just so incredibly validating and rich to me to think that um, my book would be in those places. And um, the fact that my book is in those small libraries and rural communities means that it's probably in, in some high schools as well. And it means that um, more Indigenous kids and youth would be able to access it. And I've had quite an interesting response to my book from um, Indigenous youth, especially from youth who are uh, maybe struggling with gender identity or their sexual preference and they're unsure or insecure or, you know, which I think probably most youth go through a phase like that. But um, I've had at, at events, like I was at Camosun College, um, they put on a, a little 
event for me, um, a kind of a launch and celebration of my book in October of 2018. And there were two youth who came up to me and it was obvious that they were a, a guy and a girl and they were you know, maybe 17 or 18, maybe 19. And it was obvious that they were experimenting with um, their identity and testing things out, their gender and probably their sexual preference as well. And they, they said to me that they, they wanted to get my book and um, they wanted to get me to sign it after my presentation and they wanted to visit with me. I, I was so touched. They were the first ones uh, at the event to come up to me and, and chat with me and kind of huddle with me. And um, so I thought after the event, I would get a couple of books and gift them my book and sign them these gifted versions. But as soon as they opened the little kiosk for me to sign, they were the first ones in line and they had already bought the book and they were just giddy. They were just thrilled to have bought it and to have a chance to chat with me and, uh, and get me to sign my book in person. And they promised to stay in touch and uh, they have. And then my family did a, a similar event. Um, they, uh, organized a family celebration for me in the week Thanksgiving weekend of 2018 and they insisted that I come home and they set up a family feast but what started that all was that one of my my, my first cousins cousin my age her her one of her daughters had heard that I, I had written a book and so she went to their little one room library in uh, in her little town and found the librarian who works maybe half a day a month and said, my cousin has written a book and I need it. I want you to bring it in for me. And, and the librarian did. So within a day or two, she had it. And it took my cousin a few days to read my book. And then she posted on Facebook that um, she was maybe in her, she's in her thirties uh, now, but she said that that book could have been telling the story of her life, that there were so many parallels. And she said that reading that book, helped her with her own personal healing so much and that it could help many in our family with their healing if we let it. And um, I had an, another interview yesterday with, uh, with a person uh, from Quebec city um, for a, a book festival that an indigenous book festival that's going to be done in French. And um, uh, she was particularly touched about uh, by the part of my book that deals with transgender issues. And she thought that it was well done in my book and that she congratulated me on bringing out the transgender issue so clearly and, uh, and dealing with it so clearly and said that um, it had that part of the book, well, the book in, in, in total had, touched her incredibly, but that part of the book had a very special meaning for her as a transgendered person herself, recently transgendered. And um, so in that conversation, um, one of the questions brought out of me the fact that I did, she, she asked me why I wrote, why I included that theme and why I wrote the book in such a, a frank candid and raw manner and I said I just wanted to give people freedom like to liberation from shame and guilt uh, the shame and guilt that comes with being different and um, having things that you part aspects of your personality and who you are that you have to hide all of your life because you're so afraid of how other people will react to it, whether people, your family or friends or community or society will continue to accept you and love you if they knew the truth about you. So I, I really did, I was able to answer that. I, I wanted to throw the doors open on that conversation and give people the freedom to speak their truth and to feel more confident in living their lives they were, the way they really needed to, to feel complete and whole. What projects have I been working on lately? I'm working on my novel, my first novel, uh, which is based on life experience, life experience, but it's fictionalized. And um, I'm about 
uh, two thirds of the way through the first draft of the manuscript, I believe, although you never know. <laughs> but uh, I got accepted into the BAMF um, Writers Studio in 2018 to work on that novel, and I got, I kind of hit the ground running, and I had five weeks um, in a writer in residence kind of situation to, to work on it with two mentors. One I mentioned earlier, Caroline Addison. And um, so I was able to get a really good start uh, for that novel, and I've been working on it since then. And um, I'm also working on, I'll just show do a little show and tell here. This is um, the manuscript for Pia Gal, my second book. It just landed on my desk uh, Friday evening to do the final author's proofread. And before we published Mama Scotch, I didn't know that was a stage in the process. But yes, the author, once it's all laid out and the technical edit is done, the substantive edit is done, the, the author gets a chance to go through the, the, the manuscript one more time to look for any errors or omissions or anything. Um, I mean, it's not wide open, but you can make some minor changes and corrections at that point. And so that's what I'm doing. I had to put everything down this week just to look, go through the manuscript of Pia Gao, and it's a very exciting stage to be at. And I've been commissioned by my same publisher, Douglas and McIntyre, to uh, work with the well-known Indigenous author, Drew Hayden Taylor, on a, a compilation, a collection of essays about the future of Indigenous people in Canada. And um, so I'll be working on that. It's due in October. So I've just been sort of brainstorming what I'll say about um, Indigenous people in Canada moving into the future. I have lots of ideas. And I think part of the reason that my publisher asked me to do that is um, uh, I experimented with magic realism and futurism a bit in Pia Gao. And I think she liked the way it worked in there. So uh, she asked me to to write an essay about it as well. And what else am I working on? Um, in a way, I guess I'm a victim of my own success because now I get asked to write blurbs for other authors' books. And uh, so I just wrote one, sent one off yesterday. And, you know, I feel I have to do due diligence for that and actually read the book thoroughly and carefully and uh, take time to formulate a really good um, assessment because a, a blurb, as you know, is... Um, is really a mini review that's going to be on the a jacket of the book, either the back or the front or inside. So I'm doing that for a few different books right now, actually, and that that's a lot of fun. And I had been booked for events um, every, I had three or four a month from the end of April of this year, right through to the end of November, and they were all canceled. I was scheduled to travel you know, every week, I think, from the end of April to the end of November. Everything was cancelled, so everything has gone virtual. So very much like this presentation, I've been doing recordings on my own or recording uh, presentations. And I have to thank you for doing this. This is much easier than uh, just sitting down with my phone by myself and <laughs> coming up with something. So thank you for this. Strong libraries, strong communities.